morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Turner, Dr. Michelle Turner, um, and I'm the executive director of the USC Black Alumni Association, one of the co-hosts of this event. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our beautiful campus um, and to this very significant conversation among our nation's finest exemplars of leadership. Because it is Black History Month, it is even more deeply tenured that these individuals are black Americans, who not only represent excellence throughout their careers, but whom have pioneered the journey of being black in America as executives within highly constrained workforce infrastructures that were not openly welcoming or easily tolerant of their capability or authority. It is important that we have dialogues that are frank about this. It is important that we as a people, and I'm speaking about black people specifically, that we use numerous opportunities to speak our truths because so many presumptions have been made prior and even surrounding us today about what our leadership capacity is, about what we can do, how far we should go, rather than valuing an understanding of our aspirations and how we can absolutely better shape policies because of our experiences and perspectives. Today's panel will feature four current and former African American chiefs of police to examine the racial challenges they have experienced within the law enforcement culture to reach the highest rank at their agencies. The conversation will explore how and why racism within the profession exists and in fact may be worsening as national polarization increases. Police departments are challenged with attracting and recruiting an organization, representatives, representative of the communities they serve in an attempt to build trust and legitimacy. Our panel today features Rochelle Brakney, Chief Charlottesville Police Department, James, <clears throat> James Butts, Mayor, City of Inglewood. <laughs> Bisa French, did I do that? Perfect. Chief, Richmond Police Department. <laughs> and John Thomas, USC Department of Public Safety. And our panel will be moderated by Errol Southers, Executive Director of the USC Safe Communities Institute. And hopefully you will take the time to read their bios, which are impressive. And I'm sure that Errol will also present those when the panel starts. But I am honored, deeply honored, to share the panel with the, share the morning with them. Now, some of you may already know this, but I had to do some research on this because I will tell you frankly, um, I never knew a black police chief in all of my long living. I never knew a black police officer. And I often wonder about um, how that might have changed some of my perception about how I moved and navigated through my community if I had ever known that. And for me, it's interesting that our two visiting um, Police chiefs are from Virginia, which is really where my family is from. Um, no, Richmond, California. Richmond, California. <laughs> See, you know, I, my heart goes immediately to Virginia. But, okay, close, but Charlottesville, we got you. Richmond, you know, and, and the thing is, it still, it still works though, because um, for me, at a very personal level, all of these cities are very circular to me. I grew up in the Bay Area. And even with that, I never knew a black police officer. So, um, but I did some research and I found out that the first black police officers were hired in the United States in the period of the early 1860s. And in fact, the first black woman police officer was hired by the LAPD in 1919, Officer Georgia Ann Robinson. However, the first black police commissioner was not appointed until 1988, when Willie Williams was appointed commissioner in Philadelphia. He later would also be appointed as commissioner in Los Angeles in 1992. 
Although his tenure was problematic, um, I lived here then, and many of us certainly remember what those times were like. However, problematic due to re relationships with the commission itself, Mayor Reardon, and um, our times known as the civil unrest or the LA riots, depending on what side of that conversation you are. Which brings us to the heart of what I am sure will be discussed today, the future of community policing and what these leaders believe will be necessary to keep our black children, our young black men, of which I have two sons, our black communities and our communities in general, especially in our mega city environments, safe. And they should know what is required because of their leadership experience and their heart for our highly nuanced, complex, racially tenored communities. It is an honor to host this conversation on this campus especially given the very rich and heartfelt relationship of so many of us to our recently departed friend, Earl Pasinger, whom was, as I said before, a friend first, as well as vice president of civic engagement. I wanted to read a spotlight that was prepared so that I could really do justice to who Earl was, if you forgive me for just a few minutes. But Earl Pasinger, as I said before, was our Vice President of Civic Engagement and a respected leader within the Los Angeles Police Department and the South LA community. He passed away on December 16th at the age of 64. Pasinger came to USC in 2016 with 41 years of experience at the Los Angeles Police Department where he served with distinction, most notably as First Assistant Chief. In his role as the university's vice president of civic engagement, he strengthened community outreach and involvement in the neighborhoods surrounding USC through programs like the Good Neighbors Campaign, which provides educational and financial support to local families and businesses and organizations. He tackled tangible issues like small businesses and homelessness while working to elevate residents' social, physical, and economic well-being. I can think of so many quotes that Earl would have. I would meet him for coffee almost every day. Um, and one of his most favorite quotes to me was, and the redeemed shall speak. What, he, what that meant was, you know, I would share a lot about life as the head of a black organization. I, you know, I have the blackest organization here at USC. I'm very unapologetic, very proud about that. But to share the experiences and the journeys of what it was to um, foster conversations about black professionalism, excellence, and leadership were conversations that I could have with Earl because he truly understood the importance of the conversations but of the value. So Earl, I can only imagine what you would have contributed to today's conversation if you were here. And I just want to say on behalf of us um, who knew him well here at USC, he is absolutely missed and today's um, event is dedicated to our friend Earl. I would like to also close with my favorite quote about the impact of black leadership in America. It is something that I study um, intently. So the doctor behind my name lives in this place of understanding how to articulate the value of black excellence and leadership. Because most of the models of leadership are not racially contextual and they don't fit leaders of color. But in this month of black history, that was um, the product of the life's work of Carter G. Woodson. And when I was a kid, it was just a week. So now it's a month and you know we celebrate it however every day. One of the things that Carter said about leadership is this. We should emphasize not Negro history, but the Negro in history. What we need is not a history of selected races or nations, but the history of the world, void of national bias, race hate, and religious prejudice. And these are the issues that our police chiefs of color are dealing with today and have the experience to absolutely bring them into the world of conversation and better policy. And with that, I give you Errol Southers, our wondrous moderator and executive and leader to steward this conversation. Thank you.
So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and welcome to the Salt Price School of Public Policy. On behalf of Jack Knott, our dean, I just want to welcome you. And also on behalf of the Safe Communities Institute, where I am director, for those of you who haven't met, the, most, the, the best project specialist and assistant you can have in the United States, Jesse Red is over here. Let's give Jesse a round of applause. <laughs> this doesn't happen without her. People always wonder how we're able to have such capacity and when they talk to us at events like this, they'll say, listen, when you get back and talk to your staff, and we have to remind people, I can show my age here, if you saw the original Wizard of Oz, you remember towards the end, you got the wizard behind the curtain. You know, that's Jesse and me, so. <laughs> so I'm gonna get our, our panelists up here, but before I do, I've got a couple of people I want to acknowledge. Um, Mark Whitkoff is up here, is here. Mark is one of our donors. He is one of the reasons that we're able to do this. I know people think that we have this unlimited budget, but we don't. And, and so thanks to Mark, he's a tr generous supporter to the Safe Communities Institute. He's a generous supporter to the Department of Public Safety. He walks the walk because his son is actually in the Department of Public Safety. So Mark, thank you for all you do in helping us put this on. The other thing I want to do is I have a special friend I just met. And since it is Black History Month, I'm going to go off of the specific topic of law enforcement for a second. I'm going to have him stand in a moment if you haven't seen him. I mean, he's, he's, only, he's a person who's got more hash marks, I think, than sleeve room. Um, but I'm honored to acknowledge a special guest joining us this morning. His name is Force Master Chief Petty Officer Christopher L. Penton. He's United States Navy, retired. He, he goes by force. He's one of only 16 Force Master Chief Petty Officers in the entire United States Navy. He's a surface and aviation warfare master training specialist. He wasn't just the first African American, he was the first designated force master chief in the naval, in naval history and in the history of Navy recruiting command. He's headed the recruitment of over 40,000 military and civilian positions, ranging from the Navy SEALs to doctors and sailors. He was also featured, if you've noticed him when he stands up, he was featured in the acclaimed PBS limited series carrier about the formidable USS Nimitz, where he was part of the command team there. So I want to recognize Force. Force, would you stand and thank you for your service. And he's not going to get away that easy. You know how we are here. So we will have him back. He'll sit up here. We'll have a conversation, Oprah style, and share your life. So what I'm going to do now, uh, I'm going to ask our, I, 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 we, our time is so limited, and I, would, and I would love to read bios, but I'm going to have them share their stories as we go through some of the questions. So I'm going to ask our four panelists to have a seat here. I am going to um, open this with a, with a sizzle reel by, by the mayor. So in the interest of full disclosure, um, I've been in, in the mayor's life for about 30 years. We missed each other at Santa Monica by six months. I've been attached to him ever since. I was his assistant chief at the airport police. He's the reason that the president nominated me to head, be the head of the TSA. And so I brought him in today because, to join our current chiefs because as the youngest and first African-American chief at Santa Monica PD, there's a story to tell. So if everybody could have a seat here, we'll show our video and we'll get started. There was a time when Inglewood rightfully was called the City of Champions. In the 80s, we were home of the three-peat world champion Showtime Lakers, the LA Kings, and concerts at the Forum. The Hollywood Park racetrack drew an average of 43,000 people six days a week. Then in 1999, the music began to die. The Lakers and Kings left for downtown Los Angeles to the Staples Center. In 08, the Great Recession hit and the housing market collapsed. Off-track betting caused the racetrack attendance to dwindle, eventually to crowds of about 1,000. We negotiated an agreement in 2011 with Madison Square Garden to loan MSG $18 million in redevelopment funds for rehabilitation purposes. MSG eventually would add $82 million to that loan, and in January of 2014, the forum reopened and would become the number one concert venue in California. Then, in January of 2015, the Inglewood City Council announced to the world that we would pursue the Rams of St. Louis to relocate to our city. In January of 2016, one year later, the NFL would announce that the Rams would move to Inglewood 
for the 2020 season. The NFL owners tonight uh, approved the return of the Los Angeles Rams to the market. It's our goal to build the most unique and fan-friendly stadium in the world. We want to make citizens of the area, certainly the NFL, uh, and the residents of Inglewood proud of what we're doing here. The one thing that was true, the mayor of Inglewood, James T. Butts, and the Inglewood site was best, and tonight, the commissioner of the National Football League made it official. Everybody says, you're just being used and it's not gonna happen. I said, Fred, trust me, it's gonna happen. I said, I'm 80% sure it's going to happen. <laughs> One year later, the Chargers of San Diego exercised their option to join the Rams in Inglewood. After leaving Los Angeles in 1961 as a member of the American Football League, the Chargers returned 56 years later to the L.A. market. But Inglewood was just getting started. In June of 2017, we entered into an exclusive negotiations agreement with Murphy's Bowl, a limited liability corporation, to negotiate the construction of an 18,000 seat, state-of-the-art NBA arena. In 2018, the city negotiated the sale of the old security bank building to the LA Philharmonic to be redesigned by Frank Gehry into an orchestra hall at a cost of $15 million to house the youth orchestra program of the LA Phil. Last week, that construction began. In March of 2019, the Girl Scouts of Greater Los Angeles moved their headquarters from Marina Del Rey to Englewood into a newly renovated facility. In 2020, the NFL Network will leave Culver City for the Englewood Entertainment District, and Englewood is being considered to host WrestleMania in 2021. In 2022, Super Bowl 56 will make Englewood the center of attention of the free world as we host America's biggest football game. In 2023, the NC2A Championship Bowl game will be held here in 2024. The Clippers are scheduled to call Englewood their new home. Negotiations are underway for a FIFA World Cup in 2026. And in 2028, the Summer Olympic Games will open here in the city of Englewood. Like the legendary Phoenix rising from the ashes, Englewood rises once again, soaring to heights never before imagined. Welcome to Inglewood, where the only thing that has changed is everything. Okay, thank you, Mayor. So what I do, on, what I do want to do before I get started again, um, I'm one of those folks that's here um, because of Earl. Um, I, knew, I knew Earl most of my career and he hammered me when he was at LAPD and, and I was at Santa Monica and I had to listen to stories about Oregon's football team. Um, and as, as opposed to our own, especially when we were losing a lot that, at that time. But we stayed friends and, and lo and behold, after all those years of jousting back and forth, Earl wound up here. So I'm, I'm just really honored that we could do this today in his honor and if you would, join me in recognizing the Paysanger family who is here joining us today. There was nothing more intimidating than having someone like Earl as your mentor sitting in your master's class, taking the class um, last year and so I, I think I did my best, but he was a formidable student and I was proud to have him there. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to open up uh, with Chief Brackney. I'm, I'm going to give her a uh, home court advantage as she traveled the furthest today. <laughs> and I'm going to ask all of you, but I want to start with not sort of an obvious question, but what's the most challenging issue you had to address upon your appointment as chief in Charlottesville? So thank you, thank you for having us. Um, he's right, um, a five, six hour flight yesterday, um, and then I have that back tomorrow. So um, let's just talk about a little bit about Charlottesville. If you don't know Charlottesville, Virginia, and what happened in 2017, um, probably leave the room now. In <laughs> no reason to even have the conversation. So imagine I arrive in Charlottesville after the events of 2017, and where there's national and international spotlight on my arrival. 
I'm arriving as the first African-American female, the first um, female um, to lead that agency after events there not only were nationally recognized, but internationally recognized. And then we're in preparation for the marking of the events of 2017. We're still in the courts um, trying to fight that neo-Nazis aren't permitted to come back to the community in 2018, that they don't have another rally there. Um, we're fighting remarks that um, our current administration has said about there being fine people on both sides of this issue. And then when I arrived there, um, I met with um, signs that say cops and Klan go hand in hand, honk if you hate the police. Um, and that's from the, the African American community who feels though they've been victimized by the policing agencies because of the events of 2017. And then I'm being met by other groups like Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer who hate me because I'm a black female. Um, and they are calling me quota hire, um, affirmative action hire, um, forgetting that I at that point had 32, 33 years of policing experience um, and that there were white males who should have been put in that place. Um, so I'm now having to prove my credentialing um, very comfortably not calling me chief or even calling me Dr. Brackney. Um, oftentimes there is a backwards way of demeaning you by calling you by your first name and putting you on the same level um, with individuals. I was constantly reminded um, that I'm a northerner. I'm not an internal person from the agency, so I don't come up through the agency. I don't know the historical politics of the agency nor of the city. And now I'm preparing to go in front of the national and international spotlight again as all the media descends on me um, to talk about what are the qualifications and how do I avoid the next incident of rioting, um, not only on UVA's campus, the University of Virginia's campus, but into the city streets again. And Charlottesville has a bigger reputation than it is. It is only 10.2 square miles. It has 49,000 residents. But you would think this is a very large city based on the things that had occurred there. Um, and what was my planning going to look like so that I did not have the same type of rioting um, that had gone on? When I say rioting there, um, I, it doesn't matter what side of the issue you were on. There was just chaos in the streets and the violence um, in those streets. In the interim, we were in the middle of charging James Alex Fields and preparing for his trial for when he plowed the car into the crowds. So I'm preparing for a national trial and marking of the events. Um, all the spotlight is there and I've got six weeks from the time I'm hired until the anniversary to see what we can do to ensure the safety of that community. Um, and I'm at that point, I'm living in a hotel because I had not moved into our home in Charlottesville. So um, I have every sort of competing interest and everything that could go wrong is lining itself up to go wrong. Um, in addition to that, you have political interest um, who are pulling at you saying that we don't want another 2017. And um, those political interests could care less how I get it done. We just don't wanna be in the spotlight again. So that was my mindset um, as I was foolish enough to put my hat in the ring um, for the chief's position, knowing what I was going into. And the last part of that is I didn't know my agency. I didn't know, um, who had been impacted, um, who was hurt by the events that were going on there, um, and then what were some of those political beliefs um, around these tensions, around these Confederate statutes and monuments that would have to, or, which is what this was all about, coming down. So there are historical legacies where people in policing, whether we want to admit it or not, and it's often generational, um, whose attitudes are very much aligned with some of those attitudes that we know exist currently to today um, about what does policing look like and what does it look like when you're talking about black and brown bodies. 
So that was where some of the things I was facing as I was walking through the door. <laughs> So Chief French, I'm going to go to you next because there are challenges already, sometimes made better or worse by the fact that you, unlike your colleagues here, came up through Richmond PD through the ranks. So tell me what your biggest challenge was with that behind you now being becoming chief in that agency. Sure. So let me tell you a little bit about Richmond first. Richmond is in the San Francisco Bay Area um, near Oakland. And we have a population of about, of about 110,000, well, when you count the undocumented populations, probably but more like 130,000. Um, historically, we've been one of the most violent cities in California and in the nation. We are always ranked kind of with Compton back in the, you know, bad days, um, and Camden, New Jersey, um, just one of a very historically violent city. Now, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've changed that perception, and we haven't, um, we've really worked on our community policing efforts so that, and we've reduced our crime significantly um, so that we're no longer in that range. We still have our fair share of violent crimes, but we went from an agency or a city that had upwards of 50 homicides a year to our lowest point of having 11 homicides in the last few years. So um, we've had our challenges. And I have been there through these challenges. Uh, when I first got there, we were um, just running from call to call. It was just basically reactionary policing, going from shooting to homicide, um, just very reactionary. And now we're doing a lot of proactive work, really focusing on community policing and everything that we do within our agency. So going up through the ranks has been a challenge in of, of itself. Um, I was the youngest captain ever promoted in our agency, the youngest assistant chief ever promoted in our agency, first female at those ranks, um, first you know, African-American and Latina female at those ranks. And so there were a lot of firsts. And um, through that, I, I think that the one thing that's helped me out is my consistency. And, and I know the question is, you know, is it harder to come in from a different agency? I don't have that perspective. Or, you know, how is it, you know, going up through the ranks? And I think that the fact that I've been consistent at every rank and people know who I am and why I make decisions and it's all based on personalities. It, it's not personalities. It, it's all based on um, who I am as a person. I look at people and it's about humanity and I treat people with respect. And they know that from every rank that I've been in. And so I have the credibility within my agency that people know that I'm going to make the right decision for the right reasons. And so that's why I think I've been successful. Um, I came to be chief because our last chief had a vote of no confidence. And within two days, he decided to leave the agency. Um, it was very unexpected. Um, but Obviously, the vote of no confidence came from a place in our agency where we had a lot of rank and file that didn't feel like they were being heard, they weren't being felt, they didn't feel respected. So it was all about communication. And I've been successful over the last six months because communication has been the key thing to really meet with people, to hear them out, to make sure they understand that I'm looking at them as a person. We focused, we focused in our agency a lot on community policing and what we were doing in the community, and we tend to forget about the people who are at, were actually tasking to do these things in the community. So when we talk about procedural justice and going out there and make sure that you're hearing people and you're you know, adhering to the tenets of procedural justice, we have to do that internally in our agencies, and that's what I've really focused on in the last six months. Thank you, Chief. So, Mayor Butts, the conversation went like this. So it's 1991, I left the Santa Monica Police Department. I called the mayor, the chief at the time, cold, and said, Chief, I'm Errol Southers. He says, I know exactly who you are. I know why you left, and I wish you had stayed here. I, we missed each other by six months. He came in. He told me he was going to be there for three to five years. He stayed for 15. <laughs> Built a new facility that we had tried to build for decades with the fact that we were actually existing in one that had failed all kinds of earthquake standards. But Chief, Mayor, my best friend, tell everybody what it was like in Santa Monica in 1991 and your toughest challenge when you got there. Well, I, actually, the, the story is not in context unless you start back in 
1972 when I joined the Inwood Police Department. I was there for, for 19 years. And so the era that I came in, blacks were just getting into law enforcement, particularly in the smaller agencies. And so I was like the uh, seventh uh, black officer hired, and four of the previous seven were let go, usually on probation. They said you couldn't write reports, and one was forced out another way. And it was um, a city that from 1922 to 1938 was the central headquarters for the Ku Klux Klan in Southern California. That was what Inglewood was. Inglewood up until the early 60s was completely white. Uh, they had covenants on the homes that said you couldn't sell to a colored person. The first blacks that moved in actually had to have straw buyers that were white and then deed the houses over to them. That's the kind of city that it was. And so when I came in uh, in the 70s, that was the era of white flight. And so as you can imagine, the, the department reflected the attitudes of, uh, of the community. So um, I rose to the rank of deputy police chief, uh, the second in command of the department. And so that's where I came from. And we integrated the department by just making hiring fair and when police represent the complexion of the community, you tend to have a better quality of policing, but, but leadership is a big, big, plays a big role in that. So then we go to Santa Monica in 1991. I was 37 when I was selected and uh, the youngest police chief in the state of California, first African American to head of the department. And uh, the, the Santa Monica was like the land that time forgot. <laughs> you know, Errol had left a number of African-American officers had left because you would have no upward mobility. Uh, you were ostracized if you tried to promote. Uh, the first African-American mayor, Nat Travis of the city, left the department as a sergeant because he was told he would never promote to lieutenant. That was the organization I came into. And so uh, the first thing that you have to do if you're going to gain credibility back then, first of all, the first impact is visual. You have to be fit. You have to be more fit than the officers you lead. You get into the credibility. Secondly, you have to have a strong work ethic. Every organization I've worked in, I was always the first to come in and the last to leave. Uh, because that sets a tone that you're going to be there and you're going to pay attention. So hiring is essential. However, and, and you know, I think too much is made of uh, the chief being of color. The issue is the culture that you're gonna set because they had, a, they had a culture, and it was a very negative culture. And one thing about police work, and it's one thing I've always said, power magnifies flaws. The police have an extraordinary amount of power in the community because they decide who gets tickets, they decide who gets arrested, who gets a record, who gets cut slack, who gets intervention. And if you have an organization that are usually self-perpetuating these practices go on year in and year out, and people are never called on them. And so for me, if uh, the, 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 the most basic level of disrespect is police discourtesy. And the police culture then was such that the guys, I call them the guys, the captains would tell me the guys aren't gonna like that. And I says, well, the guys don't get named in lawsuits. I do. And we're going to do, and we're going to do things the way I want to do them. And so in, in police work, when you do investigations, the standard is 50% plus one evidence that it occurred before you can sustain a complaint. <laughs> and that's, that's a very arbitrary standard. And so a lot of times you're not going to make it, particularly when the discourtesy occurs one on one. But that's the first basic level of disrespect for a community. And so what I would do whenever there was a complaint that we could not sustain, then I would bring the officer in and I, they'd have to sit across from me and I said, so tell me about this. And I said, you know, this is one on one. And so you get the benefit of the doubt. But I said, if this happens again, let me tell you something. I don't care if it's one on one. It's going to be sustained. Now, if you have five conversations like that, attitudes change. And so the whole thing is who you hire, how you promote, the mission, vision, and values of, of the agency. Now, a lot of agencies have mission, visions, and values, but they're just words on a wall. They're pablum for the public. With me, 
you had to memorize the mission, vision, and values. Every staff meeting we went out in the room, you had to repeat them, and you had to tell me what they meant. I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it at the airport, too, with Errol. He was an assistant chief for me, uh, and Brian Walker back there is an assistant, was an assistant chief as well. He's in charge of our emergency management division. And, and I would tell you, that's what it takes. You have to change the culture of an organization. They have to know that the agency head, whatever color they are, is paying attention to what's going on. And I would recite the mission and value, vision values first. And these are the things that start to deconstruct an old culture, replace it. And then you delete the, dilute the gene pool so that everybody is represented. And so by the, time, by the fifth year in Santa Monica, we were named by the ACLU as one of the top most, five top most diverse police departments in the state of California, going from 90% white male when I came. And it isn't just about numbers, it's about quality. So if, I don't want, I could go on for a long time, but I, I think you kind of get it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. So let me switch to John Thomas. JT, interesting route, came up through LAPD, was Chief Bratton's adjutant, left here, went to DC, I'm correct? And then comes back to comes back home, literally, having grown up in this neighborhood, to become the head of the university's police department. And now campus policing is very different. So, Chief, tell us your challenges when you were appointed as chief. You know what? Uh, it is very different. And I often say, you know, you can probably get away with uh, articulating and giving lip service to, camp to community policing if you're a municipality but you can't do that in a, in a university setting. We're be, you're beholden to so many individuals. You're beholden to, in our case, we're beholden to not just the students, faculty, and staff, but the surrounding community. Our officers patrol the areas adjacent uh, to the university, uh, probably a good mile and a half in all four directions. So for me, you know, probably the biggest challenge uh, was you know just adapting from an agency like LAPD, which is a huge entity, and looking at you know uh, a community such as USC, a community that I knew quite well growing up here, and I think that was the greatest advantage that I had was not my police service and my experience; it was actually growing up in this neighborhood and understanding what the dynamics of this community. Uh, and the, the expectations of the members of the community, what those were and how USC impacted it. So I think the biggest challenge for me was just how, how do I, as a black man growing up in this community and, and having the experiences that I had adjacent to this community and understanding, one, there was a value for many members of the community. My grandparents moved to this community in 1947. You talk about being a white community, a pretty much a white community, but it was. And over time, a transition from um, that to being pr predominantly African American, and now it's primarily a Latinx community. So, you know, just understanding one, I'm not in LAPD anymore, <laughs> and, and also understanding that, you know, the precarious position that the university is to this community uh, and understanding that, you know, I have a responsibility not only for the safety of the students uh, that are here from around the world, because it is a global, global campus. We have uh, students from every corner of the globe but also balancing that with the community, this community that uh, I grew up in. And despite what you hear on the news, USC didn't move to downtown Los Angeles. It is not downtown. This is south of Los Angeles. And it has a proud history that you know, has transformed from you know, different demographics. And it's just the balancing of that. You know? So those are, that was probably my biggest challenge, understanding that one, there was a greater expectation to really push out uh, community engagement, and I don't really like to call it community policing. I, I like to call it relationship-based policing, because that's what it comes down to. Uh, you ask 10 officers what community policing means, and you'll get 10 different answers. But everybody understands what relationships mean, and that's the core of, I think, what, what we're all talking about. It, it really comes down to, as leaders, and particularly as black leaders, what are you, what, 
what are what is your imprint on the organization and the values and cultures that translate into uh, uh, equity and procedural justice when it comes to uh, those uh, disparate communities? So JT, I'm going to stay with you for the next question. And you know, I grew up in the '60s. Um, I don't have to tell anybody on this panel what that was like in, in, on the East Coast. So I didn't always want to be a police officer. So what made you decide to become a police officer? Did you always want to be one? And if so, tell me why. And if not, tell me what changed your mind. I was right out of college. I wanted a job. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a job with benefits. And actually, I applied to two places. I, but I did know I wanted to do something that provided an opportunity to serve other people. I felt like the best type of position for me was one where at the end of the day I knew that I helped people. So I actually applied for LA Fire Department and LAPD. And I said whoever calls first <laughs> is where I'm going. So LAPD uh, called first and um, literally that's how I wound up here. But and I think part of it also growing up in South LA and my parents and grandparents being from the rural South, you know, and I remember being imprinted on me very early as a young, young kid is when my, my grandparents particularly, when they would see black police officers, they would say, that's progress. And that word always stuck with me, you know. So I knew that despite all of the, the issues that the black community had with the police departments, uh, particularly here in Los Angeles, and also from where they were from, but I always, that word, that's progress. And I wanted to be a part of that. So I think yeah, subliminally, that was a part of my decision making. Dr. Bratney, did you always want to be a, want to be a police officer? <laughs> Not even close. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there was there was no one who looked like me on the police department, right? They didn't have women um, at that point in time, and. Um, we had always heard the histories, and I grew up in a very um, violent, I'm from Pittsburgh originally, um, so I grew up in a very violent neighborhood um, in which police interactions were not positive. Um, if you haven't figured out, I'm multi-ethnic, so um, my father, who was a white male, married this black woman in the 60s when it was illegal, um, so that was not well received particularly by structural institutions like policing, right? That just didn't go over very well. And much like Chief Thomas, um, I had just got out of school um, and um, I attended a PWI, but I had a, what I call a black mom. So it didn't matter. Um, she had two rules. You either work or you're in school. There was no, um, and then there was the third option is the military, which some of my sisters did. But you didn't have a whole lot of options. And in the early 80s, um, working for a municipality gave you guaranteed benefits, right? And in black community, the military, the post office, driving a bus, fire, police, had secure civil service benefits. And growing up in a very industrial place like Pittsburgh, unions and benefits were important to that community. Um, and then I just, when I did join, and the reason I stayed is, um, I always thought I was gonna fail out, right? But my mother had, um, as long as I was trying, right? That's how we are as parents. As long as your kids are trying, it's okay. Um, and I had also thought in my eyesight, um, programs like Rookies, which were like filmed out here, um, I thought it would be much like that. Or, uh, <laughs> or Hill Street Blues, which is from the Pittsburgh area, or Barney Miller and, <laughs> So I figured I could never do any of those things, right? Um, so, but once I got into it and really saw um, even the, the surprise and faces of black community and how proud my grandmother was, who never would have thought she would have seen a female police officer, um, let alone one at 21, and she would say things after a while and why I stayed is, um, that's my grandbaby over there. She's a police officer. <laughs> she, she would hit that po real hard um, before it became negative, right? Um, and you know, and once I stayed, like, how can you, when you see the pride of, you know, you know, my dad who had a sixth grade education, my mother who got a GED in her 30s, my grandmother who came from Alabama, and you know, all they knew was sharecropping. That they had this literally five foot seven, 21 year old, 125 pound 
police officer. Um, that it was, I mean, it was important for the black community to see that. And um, here I am 30 years later. <laughs> okay. Chief French, always wanted to be a police officer? So I was, um, I was a little bit different. I was, when I was really young, I, I saw things as black and white. You either, you did something bad, you got punished for it. And so, yes, I was a law and order type of kid. I've, I've, changed, I've changed my views as I've gotten older. There's a lot of gray area in that. <laughs> Um, but early on, um, as a kid, I remember one specific incident walking to school with my brother. And in this particular neighborhood that we lived in, um, the KKK was there. And I remember seeing the words KKK written on the sidewalk and written on the fences. And I remember asking my brother, what does that mean? Why, why is that written? And he said, oh, there are white people that want to kill black people. And I'm like, well, why aren't they in jail? Like, take them to jail. <laughs> and so, you know, I learned that it wasn't just that easy, but I just kind of had that law and order type mentality back then. If somebody does wrong, they should be held accountable for it. Um, at the age of 18, I had a life changing experience. I got pregnant with my first child right out of high school. And at that time I figured, and I had, I, I used to watch cops in high school and it was like, oh, I, I would like to do that. But I was a little scared to do it actually. But when I got pregnant with my son, I said, I, you know, I disappointed my family. I needed to figure out what I was going to do to support myself and my son. I didn't want my parents to have to support us. I didn't want to be on welfare. And I said, it's now or never. So as soon as I got old enough to apply at 20 and a half years old, I started applying for different police agencies and got hired at 21 with the police department and haven't looked back since. Outstanding. Okay. Mayor Butts. Why do you make me follow all these great stories? <laughs> Okay, so for me, I grew up in the uh, 77th Division in the 60s, okay? And that means as soon as you start driving, you get stopped all the time, you're out of the car, on the curb, hands this, search that. Um, never, it would never cross my mind to think that I would be a police officer. I, I wanted to do two things from the age of seven, and I was always a very determined child. I wanted to be a corporate attorney because I saw on a news broadcast that one made 370000 a year in 1960, or I wanted to be a Los Angeles Laker. There was no in between. <laughs> Always a very good student, had a very high SAT, received a number of uh, scholarship offers from Ivy League institutions because they were trying to recruit blacks at that time. I took the scholarship to Cal State Los Angeles because one, it was dual. I got money for academics and money to play basketball. I was going to get to play with some all city players, Raymond Lewis, Latham Tyler, Adrian Shivers. And, and I said, this is the ticket. And I went to Cal State, bought a 72 Volkswagen with the money the school was giving me for my <laughs> basketball money. And I was, things were going well. We were 24 and one our freshman year. We beat the UCLA freshman team. They, I'm on point. <laughs> I'm on point. I'm a business major, doing well in school. Then I had two knee surgeries. Couldn't play basketball anymore. Need to pay for that Volkswagen. <laughs> Somebody comes to the hospital from my church, and they give me this uh, classified ad from the Herald Examiner. How many of you old enough to remember the Herald Examiner, right? And it talked about a community service officer position in the city of Inglewood. It paid from 357 to 419 an hour in 1972. That was big money back then. And you had, could only work 20 hours a week and you had to have a full load in college. I said, that's great. I didn't know it was in the police department. <laughs> so I take that job. And uh, this is the environment in the Inglewood Police Department. We had a sergeant, his name was Sergeant Bill Hatcher. He was from Alabama and he talked like this. And uh, I had a natural, okay? And Sergeant calls me in my first day. He says, Butts, you need a haircut. And I said, Sergeant, I, I wanna cut my hair the way that it should be. I said, so I'm gonna get the manual out. And I says, well, it says that it can't touch your collar. I said, my hair ain't touching my collar. It says your sideburns can't go past the middle of your ear. I said my sideburns aren't past the middle of my ear. And finally it says that your hair can't cover your ears. 
I said my hair doesn't cover my ear, so how should I cut my hair, Sarge? <laughs> now come to be 20 and a half. And they're encouraging me to take this port test. It's a test, a combined test for all the South Bay agencies, Santa Monica, and the Sheriff's Department so that they save money on recruitment costs and they, they pool the, the list. Finished first on the list, took a position in Inglewood because I said, now I can save up money for law school. Okay, that's, that's the goal. I'm, one goal deferred, the other one is still alive. <laughs> and uh, then I get to looking at the, the structure and the raises, and I said, wow, I said, you can retire at 53, and I'm always a math person, right? And I said, so I should get, make at least a lieutenant. We get about 6% in raises a year. I said, I'm gonna stick this out, and then I'll be an attorney at 53. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm the deputy chief in the police department. The chief is supposed to leave uh, later that year, and I said, okay, well, I'll st I, I can be chief. I'm like 36, thir 36 at the time. And uh, he's supposed to be leaving later in the year. I took a test in Santa Monica and Pasadena just for the experience, hoping that, you know, I would become chief at Inglewood. Never believing I would be a finalist because these were national recruitments. I'm a finalist in Pasadena, finalist in Santa Monica. They offer me the job in Santa Monica, and I'm terrified because I, I, I'm 37. It's not civil service. And if you're terminated as a chief, at will as chief, you're not going to get a chief's job again. And so I'm almost thinking I'm not going to go. And so I asked the chief, well, I, I determined I was going to go, and I asked the chief, so are you still leaving at the end of the year? And he says, Jimmy, he says, uh, they left me hanging on the vine. He was a finalist. He was supposed to be being appointed by Pete Wilson to be the director of the Office of Criminal Justice Planning. He says, they left me hanging on, dying on the vine. I may be here another five years. Now I really got to make a decision. I asked three people that I really respected, you know this, uh, and one of them was Truman Jock. He was a television personality. Uh, we had a show, Which Way in L.A.? He was a public information officer for the city of Inglewood. I said, Truman, I don't know anybody in Santa Monica. I lose my job there. I'm done. I said, what do you think? He said, Jimmy, my boy, you need to climb high while your legs are young and strong. Mm -hmm. I never forgot those words, and I never looked back. And then I got to Santa Monica. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a higher crime rate than the city of Inglewood because of property crime, 19 murders that year, but more importantly, they spent three, an average of three and a half million a year for use of force cases, most of them shootings, most of them shootings of African Americans in questionable circumstances. And so, change the shooting policy. Because the way this policy was written, you could make up your mind that you were gonna shoot somebody by the time you got there. And this one was a lot more stringent. And this is where I tell you about, I think I mentioned the, the captain saying what the guys like. And so they said, the guys aren't gonna like it. <laughs> And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you what I said, but it was something on <laughs> the guys. And um, we brought in the DA's office. We brought in Gord Graham from the Higher Patrol, who was a liability um, instructor. Uh, and we, we had 48 hours of training on the implications of the use of deadly force. We went from an average of 12 officer-involved shootings when I got there to none within five years. And our liability figure went from three and a half million a year when I got there to we spent $1,849 in the last year that I was there. I was very proud of that. And it wasn't because we were less safe, it was because we were more, were more mindful. We had grown as an organization. Uh, the crime rate dropped 64% while I was there. We went from uh, one of the highest crime rates for a city of nine square miles, 110, no, 88,000 people, to one of the lowest. And we never had more than two murders in the last six, seven years I was there. And so use of force doesn't correlate with safety at all. Mindfulness, dedication, being smart and strategic in your deployments, that's what's, what equates to a lower crime rate. Went to the airport. And, and the position I had at the airport was created 
because of a, 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 an expose by David Goldstein of KCAL 9 News that said LAX was extremely unsafe and it was rated in the lower tier of Category X airports in the country. And so I brought a team with me. Brian was already there as a captain, but promoted him, brought in Errol, brought in three other people. And uh, within five years, we were rated number one in the country by the TSA and for, for aviation safety, number one. Organizational culture is everything. People operate in the shadow of the leader. If the leader takes things seriously, if the leader comes to work on time or early, leaves late, if, you, if it's known that you'll be promoted based upon your contributions to an organization, then culture changes. Now the first thing that happens when you come into an organization, you have three circles when you're a chief. There's the, the public, the elected officials, and the people in the organization. And when you come in, you have all three circles because everyone is hopeful that you're going to attend to their needs. Now the first circle you usually lose is the guys because the guys exert pressure on a chief to keep the status quo. Don't investigate things too hard. Give us the benefit of the doubt for everything. And that's their threat, ultimately, that they can have a vote of no confidence against you. The elected officials are schizophrenic. <laughs> they, keep, they look at these two circles over here. The union can spend money on elections. The union use has, usually has the sympathy of the electorate. And what they care most about is how these people vote. So if you're smart as a chief, you're going to focus on these people over here, especially if you're an outsider, or you ain't going to be around very long. Because as long as you have two circles, you're cool as a chief. When you get down to one circle, then you're cruising for a bruise and they get fired. Um, you usually lose the guys first. If, you're gonna, if, you, if an organization is in need of change, you're going to lose the guys, but the guys are led by the union. And the unions are the most hard, the union leaders are the most hardline people in the organization. And they have the rest of the guys hostage because they're the ones that are getting their pay and benefits. And that's who you're going to have conflict with. And I had conflict with them in a big way. But within five years, we had deleted their, diluted their gene pool. The public loved the things that we were doing in, in the era of public safety. And so the elected officials, they're down with the public. And eventually, I had all three circles again. But it takes courage to be a chief when you're at will. It really does. And come back to Inglewood, had the privilege of appointing as chief an individual that I was his first sergeant when he came out of the academy. And we're in our eighth consecutive year of the lowest crime rates in the history of the city with the same formulas. Uh, in terms of violence, when I left, we, we would have like between 40 and 55 murders a year. When I came back, we're still between 24 and 38 murders a year. Last year, we had two murders. We had less than Pasadena, Torrance, and Santa Monica. I, I went back to Santa Monica to uh, the retirement of a, of a captain who was going to be appointed chief uh, in a city in Washington. I forget the name. But uh, it was my pleasure when I talked about him to tell the chief. I said, Chief, I have to tell you something. I don't feel safe here anymore. <laughs> and I'd really like an escort to the freeway to make sure I get to Inglewood <laughs> safely. I love that. We use words like work-life balance um, just because they're catchphrases. We don't believe in it, right? There isn't a single one of us um, who really does believe in it in terms of as you're starting to move up the ranks, right? There is no work-life balance. Um, so what we recently did, understanding that we have officers who are currently under stress and we don't meet their needs um, at all, but we're so focused on the community's needs. Um, I just recently hired a police psychologist um, who could just, you don't have to go to EAP, you're, it's off site, um, he has open hours, no one knows that he is our 
police psychologist so that they can have someone they can talk to, and that is his area of expertise. What does secondary trauma look like for our officers? We don't talk about secondary trauma, we just think about that in terms of other victims. But, you know, your crime scene specialists are processing violent scenes every single day, and we think about the person who's been involved in the shooting and not the person who is ingesting, literally, that trauma of everyone's lives. Um, we have started our, for, for the first time, they had no peer support groups at all. Um, so we've now sent all of our teams through peer support, um, and what does that look like? We organize time with each other now. Um, what does that time look like with each other when we're in very relaxed settings? Um, and I've organized the, I mean, we are zip lining together for team building and just to relax. I am afraid of heights, um, <laughs> but darn it, you know, um, we're trying to create opportunities that are away from the job and including um, the command staff. When we're short staffed, um, we allow our officers off and I'm out there answering calls, taking over shifts for our personnel so that they can spend time with each other. Uh, we just had our first yogi, follow him on Instagram. We have an emotional support and comfort dog that we just went through an entire process in Brevard County, Florida. The dog just returned to us um, Sunday, as a matter of fact, that understanding that we're always looking at what does emotional support look like for someone else but how interesting it is to have it in our own space. Um, there are a lot of wellness programs, and we always think of wellness as just being physically fit. Um, and wellness, um, we have free gym memberships. We now have officers who are certified physical fitness trainers so that they can do things together. Um, and we're doing a lot of extending family um, as well. I'm now often um, talking about what does childcare look like? You want a stressor? Um, single mom and you don't know what childcare looks like when you work night shift. That will stress you like no one else um, and you don't want to send your child to just anybody and we find ourselves in desperate circumstances. If you've ever been a single mom and I was a single mom temporarily and as I'm writing up the ranks, um, no one ever asks um, my male partners, what are you going to do about childcare? You know, what's going to happen when the baby's sick or you've got to go pick someone up from school? making spaces available so that you can even if necessary bring your child to our facility so that you know that someone will watch them and we have hospitals uva you have all of these hospitals why don't you set up those kinds of spaces for your officers so they don't have to worry about those kinds of things so there are a lot of innovative practices that are out there currently um, and iacp is doing a lot on the you know the below 100 is so that there's less than 100 officers killed in the line of duty, but the push is now, it should be below 100 for suicides, um, which at a higher rate than any officer who's killed on the line of duty. So before I go to Chief French to answer, I just want to say IACP is the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Thank you for acronym. Chief French. So we're doing many of the same things. Um, I, I think the, the best thing that we're doing is we're talking openly and um, we're talking openly about this issue, especially officer suicides, which has grown over the last few years, and we're, we're normalizing the conversation, so we're having regular conversations about it. Obama's 21st Century Policing incorporated officer safety and wellness into it, so it, you know, kind of pushed us to, to move in that direction. And so um, there's one thing that we just incorporated, there's an app that our officers can now use to go online and get the, be connected immediately to mental health professionals. So that takes away some of the stigma of, you know, having to call and go through EAP and all these other, um, you know, resources and they can just be immediately co connected. We have the, superior, uh, the peer support. We're also focusing on the physical health because Physical health, uh, you know, has a has a big impact on your emotional health also. So we bring in doctors to do some testing within the department, and it's all voluntary. But you know, we're we're bringing the resources to our officers, making it very easy for them to reach out and get the assistance that they need. Okay. Let me. I'm going to bounce to JT because again, a very different environment being on a campus with campus police and the attached student issues that they have to deal with? You know, for us, um, 
obviously, I think, and from my opinion, we don't do enough internally in our department. That's something that we're 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 definitely looking at. How do we, you know, how do we leverage what we the university provides and and provide that for our officers? But I do think that you know, um, and these are some great suggestions that I'll probably steal from you. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, because I, I don't think you can. You, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I don't think we can ever do enough for our, for our, for our officers and first responders in general. And, I, and we, we, we talk about officers, but I think there's a missing component that we often forget about, and that's dispatchers. Uh, dispatchers are, are first responders, too. They're the ones that, you know, take that call. They're the ones that have to direct resources. They're the ones that have to multitask. But I, when, I, when I reviewed President Obama's 21st Century uh, Task Force report a few years ago, one of the primary focuses was officer wellness. So, you know, I, looking at from the perspective of USC, because we have to deal with so many, you know, diverse type of issues. Uh, you talk about suicides, you know, it's, it's prevalent on a university campus. You talk about, you know, issues impacting emotional and mental health. You know, that's a, a growing concern, uh, you know, with the populace that we're, we're, we provide services to. So, you know, when, you know, from a university standpoint, I think we're, we're blessed from the standpoint that we do have, we're connected to a university, so we do have a lot of the professionals that can weigh in into, you know, not just our officers as they deal with the calls for services and the student issues that are 24-7. You know, when you look at, you know, the impact of, you know, a young person's life in this time period in in their lives, being away from home and, and all of the things that we're seeing uh, impacting, we, we've got to look at it from a dual perspective. We've got to look at it from not only the, the impact that our officers, when they go to respond, how are they equipped to deal with those issues, uh, what type of compassion, what type of training. So it's a little more, I, I believe, it's a little more complex from the standpoint of, you know, um, the normal law enforcement things that I had to deal with at LAPD, but also compound it with this unique demographic of young people in this, this environment. I'm gonna toss one more question since I have you here hostage. I'm gonna start with Mayor Butts and just say, if you had to do your career over again, what would you do different in, in terms of your pathway to chief? Hmm, well, that's easy, easy answer, okay? So, as you know, I never ended up doing one thing I intended to do, <laughs> right? That's about all this pathway stuff. And, and, I, and I remember mentioning to my mother, I said, you know what, Mom? I says, I never got to do a single thing I set, set out to do. And she said, Jimmy, it doesn't matter because in the end, you did everything that you needed to do. And so I never think back about what if because I've never worked a day in my life I've enjoyed everything that I've done, and, uh, and I wouldn't change a thing. Okay, outstanding. Chief French. I'm actually very similar. Um, you know, my, the, the path that I had cut out for myself, I actually never actually planned to be chief. I got into law enforcement, again, to support my son, who, you know, was the center of my life at the time, and well, still is. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but I had no aspirations to be chief, and, and things just happened that way. I, opportunities, and I just took advantage of opportunities that, that came my way, and, and that's how I landed here in this spot. So I don't think I would change anything. Okay, great. Dr. Brightley. So thank you. Um, thank you for having us and at least being willing to hear us. Um, for the most part, I would not change things, but I think what I would do is believe in myself earlier and sooner. Um, that because society will tell you as a black woman, multi-ethnic woman, as a poor woman coming from violent communities, you're not good enough. So that sort of that imposter syndrome starts to really hold you. Um, and I would believe in myself earlier and um, position myself earlier. So we had an offline conversation and what I said is, one of the things that we should always do is make sure they must consider us. Don't eliminate yourself through self-doubt, through all of the things. Force society to consider you, and not just because you're a whatever variable they're looking for at that moment, 
make them look you in the eye and say, you're not good enough. And then you'll find out most people are not brave enough to do that. Um, but believing in myself earlier that I was capable, that I was competent, that I was not just a black woman doing this thing, that literally I was led to do this thing, whether I thought about it or not, you didn't do what you needed to do, you're actually doing what you were led to do, right? And I go every morning into my office saying this one thing, and I um, hope it doesn't offend anyone, but it goes, and David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands he led them. And that's what I believe in every day, and I would have probably embraced a lot of those things earlier by believing in myself. Thank you, thank you. Chief Thomas. You know, I, I would say, you know, as I, as I look at the steel glare of my mentor right there, <laughs> Earl Pacey, you know, he, 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 he's, you know, and I, I say that jokingly because it's hard for me to, to accept that he's not here because I would have called him this morning. But, you know, mentors are valuable. And, 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 and I think none of us made it here uh, alone. Someone actually took time and invested in us, and he was one of those people that did that for me. And, you know, I think the lesson for, you know, we have a responsibility as black chiefs and, and, and mayors to actually look, look down and look at, you know, where are opportunities for us to mentor and shepherd someone like he did for me. Uh, I didn't have an opportunity to, you know, as I wanted to stay in patrol and have the fun and do all the things that cops want to do. But at some point he pulled me by the back of my coat and said, JT, you can do better. You need to do better. And, you know, and the influence that you can have through other people comes by, you know, uh, by promoting and by bettering yourself. But I do think that, you know, I guess the most powerful thing that I, I, I think I did well, actually, I had no choice. He pulled me, he, I was a sergeant, and he pulled me aside and said, hey, where do you, where, where do you want to be? And I'm like, well, I want to do this, this, and this. And he was like, well, that's not good enough. You, a good mentor pushes you to be better than you know you're capable, what you think you're capable. And that man right there was my mentor. And at my lowest points at the LAPD, he invested in me when nobody else did. So I think the lesson for all of us, regardless of where you are uh, in your station uh, of life, is there's always an opportunity to help someone else. And that's the, that's, that's the, that's the thing that I think I stumbled into by, because I had some great mentors, him being one, Bernard Parks being another, and so many other people that, um, that look like me that took the time to say, you know, uh, you may not see this in yourself, but I do. Okay. So before I close and thank all of you, I just want to give, because he came a long way, and I've known him now a week, and we're going to have him back here. I think Force Master Chief Petty Officer Penton wanted to make a comment. So go ahead, sir. I'm only going to stand up and make a comment so you can actually see me. I'm so short that you made this say it was a chair talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> what we have are the armed forces. I can only say that each one of your jobs here is more important than the job I did for 30 years. Because I'm just, I was in the Navy. You guys are in the community every day. And I wouldn't swap my job for your job. <laughs> I'm serious. Because what you do, when we out at sea, the environment doesn't change. It changes for us and we're out at sea. And we're in a more controlled, protected environment. But the environment that you provide as, armed force, as law enforcement is the cornerstone and the foundation of making not the USA, but the world safe. And I want to thank you on behalf of not the Navy, not the Army, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, or National Guard, but the armed forces. And that's not even a paid announcement by them. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. And it's not because it's Black History Month. <laughs> so on behalf of the Saul Price School of Public Policy in the University of Southern California, I want to thank all of you for your valuable time this morning. Again, I want to echo what Chief Thomas said about mentors. Um, extremely valuable. I have three people in my life that I've never made a professional decision without calling one of them. And Mayor Butts is one of them. I've caught him in the gym. 
I've, 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 caught him, I've caught him in board meetings. I've caught him at the airport. He always answers that phone. He always gives me advice, and he's never been wrong. He come in the hospital when I was having surgery. That's true. <laughs> I, and I answered I, the I phone. Said, I said, I call. I says, where are you? He says, I'm in recovery. I said, recovery from what? <laughs> But, but again, thank you all for coming today. This is extremely valuable. Thank you for your service. And, and I'm going to always end with Winston Churchill's words as I look at all of you and the accomplishments you've achieved throughout your careers. It's not the end. It's not the beginning of the end, but it certainly is the end of the beginning. Thank you very much.